Welcome to Talk Law Radio with attorney Todd Marquardt of the Marquardt Law Firm at MarquardtLawFirm.com. Welcome back to Talk Law Radio. I'm Todd Marquardt here with Cheryl Mays, a paralegal extraordinaire. Uh, she has over 20 years of experience in probate and guardianship law. And today we're talking about Texas guardianships and why they're so difficult. Uh, the primary reason being that the law does not want to take away somebody's rights. And guardianship does that by allowing somebody else to make decisions for you. Uh, but first, I want to mention Joseph Warren with Financial Planning HQ. He and I are, are going to be having a lunch seminar uh, later on in July at Alamo Cafe on 281. And so if you want to learn more about that seminar, I'm going to be talking about uh, learning how to leave a legendary legacy and Joseph Warren will be talking about the same only from a financial services uh, perspective. And uh, you can email me if you're interested at host at talklawradio.com. That's H-O-S-T at talklawradio.com. And I'll give you some more information about when and where and what. So now, Cheryl, tell us from your perspective, what are some important things that people need to do or think about uh, before they even call the lawyer to get representation uh, to file an application for guardianship? What should they be thinking about or doing to prepare for that? So to prepare for that, it would be good to ask the questions to the person that they're thinking about getting guardianship over. See where they think, um, what, they, what their wishes are. If they wanted somebody to take care of them, who is it going to be? Where do they want to go? Um, do they want to live in a nursing home or a memory care? Mm -hmm. I know sometimes that that's um, the best scenario for the person, despite what their wishes may be. Um, then you need to look at how they're spending their money. How can you help them reduce um, their debt to income ratio so that they can have a better living situation mm -hmm. for themselves? Um, if it's in a hoarding situation, you know, what can you do to make it better for them? If there's an emergency, who do you contact? Um, but before you can apply to the court for guardianship, you have to be able to prove that you've tried to get this individual help through all these other different service agencies. Right. The court the court does not want to step in and have power over somebody. Mm-hmm. They want you to use the different avenues like power of attorneys um, to have that authority to help the individual. Right. So that's a good point to, to first find out if they have capacity to understand what a power of attorney is and how it works. And do they trust anybody to make those decisions? Absolutely. Uh, make, make an appointment with the person's primary care physician. Um, and see if they believe they have capacity to um, sign a power of attorney. Mm -hmm. You know, if they agree that they do have that capacity, then contact an attorney about getting their estate plan drawn up as soon as possible. Yeah, and you can do this for yourself now while you're still healthy and alive, and then nobody will have to worry about whether you have the capacity to sign a power of attorney. But that, that's a great point. That's a good first step. Um, but everything you just said sounds somewhat confrontational. It, if it can be confrontational. My kids came to me and said, Dad, uh, are you making bad decisions? <laughs> we, we had a, I mean, um, an older gentleman, the hardest thing for them to give up is their keys to their mm -hmm. car. Mm -hmm. We had a gentleman come in this week that, you know, he was signing over his power of attorneys and everything. Yeah. And that was what he stated to me. He was like, I, I, I couldn't just give up my keys. I had to sell the cars to get rid of them yeah. because he knew something was going on to where he couldn't do that for himself anymore. Yeah, I met another guy earlier in the week, or maybe it was last week, and he was not ready to do that. And I, I tried to convince him that because of his old age, he had earned the right to have a chauffeur. Absolutely. But he 
that's that's giving up some of what he enjoys doing uh, and mobility being able to control where you go and when you leave and where to go I think that that's big uh, for their self-determination yeah and when you see um, the older individual having a few more dents in their vehicle a few more accidents Mm -hmm. being reported Um, DPS is not going to come in and take their driver's license away from them. They have to have at least three red flags against them for the DPS to call them in to take another test. Oh, okay. And uh, if they are a hit-and-run type older person, then they might not (laughs) be getting the red flags. Um, So that's a good point. You have to keep uh, an eye out for that. And it it could be very dangerous or even life-threatening for them and other people on the road. Absolutely. And then with like this Texas heat that's going on right now, if they're not properly hydrating, if they're, I know my grandfather loves to keep his apartment at 85 degrees right now and you go in there and it's sweaty, sweltering hot. Right. So, you know, if they're if it's visible that they're not taking care of themselves in a normal environment, um, that's a big indicator that something's going on that they may need help with. Yeah, or they're just stubborn and cheap. <laughs> or that. My, my dad's dad did the same thing. He'd rather take his shirt off than turn the air conditioner on. And, and that's, you know, that's the older mindset, and that's mm-hmm. wh- where it gets hard to um, tell them there's a better way now and we can help. Yeah. Or else you might have a guardian appointed. Absolutely. (laughs) So some of the constitutional reasons for making guardianship difficult are as follows. Uh, In the United States, the government's forbidden from depriving a person from life, liberty, or property without due process. So the guardianship proceeding is the due process. That's why it's difficult. So let's uh, imagine a situation where the propo- the applicant, the person who wants to be guardian, has uh, convinced their lawyers and their legal team that uh, uh, they need to file for guardianship. What are some things that they're going to be facing uh, besides just the legal pleadings, the lawsuit that has to be filed? So... With that pleading, we have to um, put some kind of medical record in there um, showing that there is some incapacity. So if you come to us and say, <clears throat> excuse me, that we're not, not quite sure if they're incapacitated or not, the first thing that we're going to do is give you um, a document called a certificate of medical exam and tell you to go see that primary care physician because right. we're not even going to apply on your behalf until we see that. Um, That's something <clears throat> that the statute requires having that by a physician that's an MD or a DO, not an NP or a physician's assistant. It has to be an MD. So actually the law on that just changed. We I actually learned this in a oh, okay. CLE yesterday. Oh, so great. now a um, nurse practitioner can sign it on behalf of an oh, MD, okay. but not a physician's assistant. Okay. So there's a little more room to be able to get that done now. So that was a, that was a great challenge for us to get approved. Oh, yeah. Um, the other thing that we are going to be looking at is um, in that application, we are telling the court that this person should not have the right to vote anymore, that they do not have the right to have firearms anymore or to enter into any kind of contract. So including marriage. And so we have to look at that person's own personal uh, belief system. Have they always gone and voted religiously? Mm-hmm. Is that something necessarily that we want to take away from them? Um, obviously, if they're having signs of dementia or other in- mental illness, the firearms is going to be an automatic oh, removal. Right. But, you know, we have to look at their marriage situation, too. Um Sometimes we have to do a post-determination divorce, mm-hmm. and what does that mean for the family? So there's, it, it's a big impact on the family as a whole and not just the ward themselves. Right. That's a good point. Uh, another part of the Constitution, uh, the 14th Amendment, uh, which was ratified in 1868, uh, uses the, the same words of the, it's the Fifth Amendment, called the Due Process Clause, 
It says, No state shall make or enforce any law which shall abridge the privileges or immunities of citizens of the United States, nor shall any state deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without due process of law, nor deny to any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. So like, just like you said, Cheryl, we don't want to take away a person's right to vote or a person's right to get married or drive unless it would be dangerous right. or unless they have no idea what they're doing. Right. If you feel that there's, uh, it's an emergency situation, you can always go down and apply um, for an involuntary commitment. But there's very strict guidelines on that as well. They have to be in immediate danger to themselves or others before um, they'll be able to do anything for the next 72 hours. Yeah. Okay, another statute, Texas statute in the Human Resources Code says, uh, this chapter does not authorize or require any medical treatment of a person who objects uh, based on uh, religious grounds. So that's one of the rights that we have is to say that we don't want certain medical treatment. Um, but if you neglect yourself and you don't have capacity to decide that, that's when a guardian could be appointed and say, well, this medical care is in your best interest. You can only deny medical care if you have the capacity to do so. Absolutely. Um, and that is that is probably one of the hardest challenges for individuals that are named as guardians for wards. You are protecting their interest and what they would have wanted in life. Um, I was the guardian of a woman that had a different religious belief than I did, and I had to make that hard decision for her um, at the end of her life. Uh, was Did she need to have surgery at a, a very advanced um Alzheimer's mm -hmm. or did we keep her comfortable and let her pass peacefully yeah and it's hard because I was a third-party guardian the family wasn't involved mm -hmm. um, she had some close friends from her church that were involved that pushed for one side and um, had known this woman for a long time prior to her diagnosis I knew what her wishes were and had to act on her behalf and not what was my religious belief. Wow. It was, that does it was sound hard. Difficult. It's hard. Okay. I want to mention that age alone does not determine whether you have capacity or not. So there's a statute in Texas Estates Code 1101.105. There's a prohibition against consideration of age as sole factor in the appointment of a guardian for an adult. If you're under the age of 18, well, that could be the sole factor because mm -hmm. uh, you don't, by definition, you don't have the capacity to sign a contract. But if you're an adult, there has to be other things going on. I mentioned reoccurring acts or occurrences of uh, bad things happening, not just isolated instances of negligence or bad judgment. So we've been talking about guardianship, why it's so difficult, and we're going to take a break and we'll continue talking about that some more, talk about some of the specific hurdles that an applicant for guardianship has to jump through in order for the court to determine that they're the right person to be the guardian. So far, we've been talking about capacity a lot. After the break, we'll be talking about who is the right person. So stay tuned. This has been Talk Law Radio with attorney Todd Marquardt, brought to you by the Marquardt Law Firm. You can learn more at marquardtlawfirm.com. And be sure to listen to the full Talk Law Radio show Saturday mornings at 11 on 930 AM, The Answer. 
Each week, attorney Todd Marquardt talks about the law. His mission with the Talk Law radio show and podcast is to help you discover your legal issue blind spots. In the beginning, God had one law. Don't eat from the fruit of that tree. Then came the Ten Commandments. Now we have federal, state, and municipal lawmakers that won't stop creating new laws. Laws that might impact you without you knowing it. Listen to the show and drop a line on Facebook or email host at talklawradio.com and let the host know what you think of the show, the topics you want to hear, and whether you want to be a guest.